Good morning cellists. Here we are in week eight still and we're going to be looking at the final part of Fauré's A Présent Rêve and the final part of the Fouillard 15th study. And before we do that let's look at some technicals. So yesterday we looked at B flat harmonic minor and I was encouraging you to think about um, block finger patterns and to think about their universality so that once you've learnt the patterns uh, you can apply them to any key um, and those if we looked at the first octave were close three close three close two um, and then it would be stretch two and stretch two again um, just looking at that bottom octave then thinking about the universality as long as you are playing the scale with stopped notes <clears throat> in other words no open strings the pattern will work so b flat minor harmonic mel harmonic was such so closed shapes with a three a three and a two and if we took the same pattern and began on an f geographic locations, same pattern. So that's actually something rather useful, a little hook and a help to really learn the patterns so you can move them into any key and feel comfortable whatever the key, whatever the key signature, however many flats or sharps. And we are going to be looking at F minor today, uh, but not actually the harmonic version, which I shall leave to you to explore. We're going to look at the melodic version because in the foray we will be using the notes of the descending melodic scale of F minor in this next fragment from bar 33 onwards. Um, so let's initially just remind ourselves of that mood. So the, the melodic minors um, are obviously um, coloured by the minor third and as they rise we raise the sixth and seventh and as they fall we fall the this, this sixth and seventh, the seventh and sixth on the way down. Uh, so on the way up it actually takes on a kind of um, a composite of the minor and the major, the top. So we have optimistic rising. <laughs> then falling all the way home. Um, and the falling version is actually its natural state with just its pure key signature and it's, it's modal, in fact, it harks back to modes. Um, the very top of that one is worth a little think. This is actually really worth getting physically into your finger muscle memory. So um, taking from the D, There we have a tone and a semitone. Now keep all the fingers down, it's really important at this point, so you can have a real sense of exactly what the geography is. That whilst you're then on this top note, slide the second finger back to, to hit, basically, and bump into the first finger, then slide the first. And then this feeling, it's a little tiny, tiny movement. You can repeat that same movement at the top of any melodic minor scale. So it's again, it's something, a generic um, caution, a cell, if you like, um, that you need to get under your fingertips, know how it feels, so that without thinking you can easily turn around the tops of your melodic um, scales. Um, in terms of trying to think of something a little bit more interesting to do with the melodic scale, um, I mean, initially, you can play with your long tonic, so you affirm about your key notes, like this. Um, and you could also potentially look at, I think usefully, the other version that is printed in the ABRSM syllabus, which is all even notes. I mean, it does mean you then change the bow, not on the tonic, and it's sort of, it's quite a good idea to have one rhythmic pattern with the bow, one sense of pulse there, and the left hand doing something else, and they don't actually quite match. So let's think what that means. If we did eight, um, <laughs> Mm 
You can hear that the change of the bow does not match where the key note is any longer. And if you're not used to that, it can feel a little disruptive, but uh, you know, go with that feeling and try and get a comfort to it. It's also about kind of a detachment of the mind. And on that idea, I think we should push a little further. So that instead of um, two groups of four, let's try three groups of four in the bow, um, bearing in mind the four is in three time. So then we'd have this, one, two, three, And you can sort of tell it's actually quite difficult to keep your mind really separated from what your left hand is doing. But by the endeavour of doing that thinking, getting your bow and your pulse counting together, means that you're going to have to drive the feeling of the left hand pattern into your subconscious. Great benefit. And don't stop there. I mean, that was 12 notes to a bow, thinking in three groups of four. You could do it in two groups of six, which I think is probably actually easier. Um, uh, yeah, because you're dividing it halfway through and, and you will get the, the much more of a sense of, uh, um, I think, cohesion, let's just think. One, there's a little bit more of a, an easy flow that I don't personally I don't find it quite as mathematically awkward as thinking of it in three groups of four. Um, go further <laughs> and put even more notes. Why not go for 16 in the bow? Um, momentarily let me just see if I can just try it right now. So we've got one, two, three, four, one, <laughs> failing to think and count at the same time. Let's see if I can try another go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> yeah, um, it's easier without actually speaking it out aloud, I do feel. Uh, so, have a go at the challenge and and look it doesn't actually matter if it goes slightly wrong just practice it right let's move on um so we've got um technicals sorted and we've thought about many different notes in the boat we can go for seven eight twelve sixteen if you like you could just do the whole two octaves up two octaves back down which actually is even easier uh, than counting strangely uh, across beats um the four, the no, the foyard. Beg your pardon, foyard study. We have got the, just a few more bars left to go from bars fifteen to the end, and to be they're really very very straightforward, um, as they are written. But let's just think about them in another way. So initially, we've do, all, what we've got so far is them. <laughs> interesting because actually at this point um, the, the phrase shapes have actually changed a tiny bit um, especially from bar 16 onwards where really it they kind of are driving towards leading into the next half a bar each time so initially it's very straight six and six straightforward like this and then just want to arrive at this next note so I in order to encourage you to think about the phrase shape and not be just divided by where the bow is sitting and chain six and six and six and six where you could easily be stressing the beginning of every six in a mechanical way I think we want to look at the how we phrase it so just temporarily play with a slurring into the next beat so in this instance, I'm initially going to have seven notes in a bow. Then I will have six, but they will keep on um, dovetailing to the next half a bar. I'll 
shaped me. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then change the bow. too long on the, the extra note that I'm putting into my slur to indicate to you what I mean and where we're leading to. I'll play it now with the correct rhythm but with this different bowing, okay? <laughs> makes it fractionally easier going into bar 16 because I have now I'm now changing my bow at the shift point um, but the other one that follows is harder because I'm also um, I will be shifting at the end of a bow stroke um, so you need to be nice and quick and nippy but the main point of the exercise is to show you that actually be careful. Our eye can be drawn to what's on the page. You see six notes and you kind of cut them very equally. Um, when in actual fact the music isn't really doing that and it's actually moving into something else and you need to lead into it. So we will do the bowing as written but now we've tried it out overlapping into the next half a bar. I hope that that will give you a different sense of the, how you get into the next phrase and that that note becomes a pivotal note, the end of one phrase the beginning of the next. Let's just see if we can hear that in the sixes as printed. So there's something about it where you can actually then be really in touch with the phraseology and there'll be a slight difference in the way you play it and it should be more musical. Despite this being a study, don't let that hold you back with thinking about musical phrase shapes. Now with regard to the whole piece, you know, it's not a particularly demanding study. Um, there's a little bit of the stretching that we've done and, and shift stretches, um, uh, shifts rather, yes, shifts with stretches. And I did mention previously that we might actually try this with 12 notes to the bow which kind of ties in a little bit with what we were doing with the scale a bit earlier on. Um, and I think still it can maintain a fairly steady pace, so it'll be really about conserving the bow. Let's just try it. <laughs> observant of you may have noticed that at one point there um, I think I had 13 notes in a bow <laughs> as I was thinking about my phrasing. That's okay. We've got to be very versatile as musicians. So that's the study of the week and I, I hope you find something useful in that. Now let's uh, finish off the journey with this bore the après so we've got to bar 33, um, the D flat. So at this point we've got the the um, notes um, from the melodic minor. You can 
can sort of hear it hopefully. Um, at the point at which we've arrived, after we've got played this D flat, we've got we're one finger short now rather than using your thumb so we can keep an expressivity um uh i think a tiny shift semitone nudge shift stay there with the b flat and stretch and then this is really falling back um exactly in line with our scale except at this point um, I'm going to go for three. Just thinking, it's not exactly in line with our scale fingering. It depends which finger solutions you do. Um, but it does feel really, really comfortable and standard kind of finger type, a pair and a pair. Uh, really nice and simple. Okay, so in terms of um, where we've got back to, we've got back to this three on the G which is quite nice to then use the fingers either side and maintain a nice high arm here so your little finger can get to it because if you come back like this and with your thumb too far around the neck it's going to have to be a bit of a stretch and you may have tuning issues and certainly comfort issues so keep that the arm slightly raised um, and it's also useful because you're about to shift again that's to a first finger substitution shift here with a bow going a second up bow so at the moment we're just looking at sort of the finger solutions and some of the bow solutions not the character the dynamic or color okay at this point I prefer to go back into the a string with this clear but thin kind of um, translucent tone notice in there there's a very quick inarticulate shift and I'd quite like to come back here to main something, maintain something of almost a kind of like um, hopelessness and sort of bleakness in that tone quality of the string. However there are various other options so one other option would be to finish across into the D string um, Notice that use a different finger. So you've, I've had a three on the G, and put your finger. You need to pivot round a little bit. Put your second finger right next to it for this perfect fit. The idea of that is that you can maintain real smooth legato in this legato um, across the string. Because literally, I could have them both at the same time. They've both got a point contact with the fingertip, and both can vibrate. Um, which means you, you're maintaining absolutely to the last fraction of a millisecond um, the tone before arriving at the final note. Because if you were to hop with the same finger, you will hear a stoppage of the um, vibration um, of the G as you hop across the string. And it obviously wouldn't be appropriate to do barring here either. And in the case of barring, um, of course, the higher string is making contact with a different part of the finger and you just don't have the same kind of contact at the fingerboard. So that's why I propose that we would take a different finger for each of those across the fifth. But because you're going across the string, you, you really do need to twist your hand right round here in that instance, in that solution, going from a three to a two. Um, we will cover this technique in another piece of repertoire in this um, next um, few weeks. <clears throat> uh, both the, the version of going 3 to 2 across the string like that, and also 1 to 2, where we go the other way around, the pivots the other way around. So we will come across more of this. Um, the other solution that can be used at this point in the foray is to go onto the D string. stretch across to the D string here for this G. So 
So you could again cross the string. I tried out a one there, you could do a one or a three. I think a one is easier at this point because of the way the arm is shaped, because it's so much further away from the shoulder. Um, and of course that gives you a very, a very, I mean, it's, it's quite commonly solved like this because you get a very hazy, uh, maybe sort of slumber filled kind of sound. So, I mean, both can work in terms of the storytelling and it could just be personal choice or it could just be you see how you feel on the day of playing and where it takes you. It's a really good idea to practice both and feel that you can choose according to how your mood is at the point of performance. Okay, now looking at the general colour and use of bow in this stretch. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, we'd had this peak with the F. Now I'm playing it a little bit too fast, but I wanted to give you the idea that we can have a robust colour from the top and we're going up in quite a kind of determined way, but I think it absolutely turns a corner when we get to the, the final, the top D flat at bar 33. Um, so that's where we're going to try out this faster bow stroke, so it's lighter. You know, and the, the little um, uh, ornamentation, if you like, ya da 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 da, V, is just coming back to the D flat, it's reiterating the D flat. And this time, some of the strength that we have in the the um, high F bar and phrase is coming back to the fore as we arrive very dominantly on this uh, D flat at bar 26. I'm just going to have a quick look to see if I can see the harmony under that. Um, yeah. It's kind of got an augmented colour to it. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so it's definitely a colour moment of change, harmonically speaking, as we arrive at this D flat feeling more settled. Um, notice also the bow um, arm, and uh, I just think. As you're coming into the heel on this crotchet D flat, be, uh, don't be tempted to push from above to get your volume. Drop the elbow and have natural arm weight. There is something in suppleness in the wrist area as well, as we're trying to get some sort of sense of flow and stroke into that D flap, um, which will be audible. So, you know, experiment with that. So, then on the way down, we follow through, and the heat starts to disappear after this point. That's a nice moment where we flow right away through to the point of the bow and we've got these two little quavers at the point. Um, which we have looked at these things before, flow with the weight of the bow to the lighter point, flat bow here at this point. Um, and it's definitely become more submissive, you know, the, the power and emotional energy we've previously seen has quite quickly dissipated. And it really does feel like the end is nigh. You just think it's going to just arrive there after all this G, which has just got a little embellishment around it, um, is the dominant and it's waiting to arrive on C. Um, however, there's a little bit more of the story to be told. So we've arrived at this gentle G, minim, at bar 38. A little breath with the bow, which is basically we take away the pressure and we're going to do like the, the pedal skimming sort of sensation. One, two. Here's going to be a finger substitution and another gentle relaxation shift, uh, lift of the bow. In terms of this, this dynamic colours, as I said, we kind of like came to a kind of um, 
a giving up kind of point to the G minim. But then it rises out of the ashes. There's a little bit more to give, a little bit more energy and power to give before again just dissipating quite quickly. It's a lot of ebb and flow, emotional ebb and flow in this piece. Um, I must admit at the end, I think it's sort of uh, quite, quite a kind of uh, positive resignation at this point. Um, and then the final solution, as we discussed a bit earlier, you can either have this um, A string or D string as you prefer. I'm going to choose A for the moment. That for this I think very very floating bow as if we got back to the very very fragile um, sense of a dream in this state coming back down to the slumber if you like um, with a final finish so the second section that we've looked at today is very much about use of bow speed it's so a light and floaty um, use of bow movement where we've got some sort of sense of the kind of um, elbow uh, weight moving around in circular shapes to to create a little bit more saucer shape kind of sounds um, and a lot of, of emotional drama albeit we're past the actual clim climax of the piece which is really the 40 at 31 um, then yeah so what we have then looking at the D flat where we began today And in all of that, don't forget your breathing. Um, there's a couple of places in there where I consciously wanted to take more of my own breath to make sure that I could pass that breath through to the instrument. Um, don't neglect it, and it's very easy when we concentrate to forget to breathe as deeply as we should or as often as we should. Um, so there's a few things for you to think about in terms of tonal colour this whole impressionist sort of sensation, both harmonically and in the kind of sound shapes that we're making. And that um, all that we do, these macro moves and micro moves, whether it's fingers or elbows or breath, they all are contributory factors to making uh, beautiful oral architecture. So I hope you enjoy your own explorations. Um, and I shall be uploading uh, the, the complete the complete piece uh, from the cello point of view I think it's still going to have to be I'm afraid uh, unaccompanied um, unless I can work out uh, lying down my own backing track that we can actually move with me we'll see maybe <laughs> bye for now <laughs>